Howdy, it's Tubal Kane again, and uh, this video will be devoted to uh, improving or modifying, or uh, I should say, replacing a missing part for my Logan lathe taper attachment. Now I'm working on a 40 or 50 chapter video course called uh, How to Run a Logan Lathe, and one of the chapters will be about making a taper using the taper attachment method. Well, when I bought this lathe five years ago, it came with this taper attachment. But, the taper attachment was not complete. Just what you see here, and this piece that slides, there's a gib back there, and this clamps right onto the bed, on the right and the left. However, the linking piece that links the cross feed onto the attachment is missing. This is a page out of the 1953 Montgomery Ward's tool catalog. And there is the taper attachment. And you can see what's missing. Well, not only is it missing, but this particular piece uh, involves the entire cross slide. In other words, you take the cross slide off and compound and install the whole thing. And that was $59.00. 70 years ago, so that was a very expensive attachment then, as are they are now. So, that's what I have to make, but it will be based on this, not exactly like that. I have a taper attachment for the South Bend lathe, so I don't even really need this, but I just need it for the video. But this will be my approach. I'm going to take off that chip guard. And I made up this wooden model here just so I can visualize or have a feel for what it will be. But on the bottom of this there will be a uh, dovetail that will fit right onto there. And then a piece that will come up over and bolt right into these two holes. And then a slot here that will connect and be bolted onto this piece. The hard part of course is going to be the dovetail. Well, what am I going to use for a piece of material? That'd be a lot of milling on a piece of steel. The original, of course, was cast iron and went all the way back. Well, you know how I dislike making drawings, so I never did make a drawing. But this, again, was the model. And from the model, I modified it just a little bit and I made the pattern. Well, the pattern took, well, well maybe an hour. Maybe a little more. And it's not really a flat back. I put a boss on here because that will be slotted out. So I cast one up. And there it is. Out of aluminum. That's a heavy casting. And you can see that that's going to bolt up onto the compound. Or, or I guess I should say cross slide. Now quite a bit needs to be removed here but I thought rather than uh, making a pattern that's kind of difficult to cast I'll just do the the final uh, milling on the, the aluminum. But it would have saved a lot of time that's why I did that here. And of course being a man that wears suspenders and a belt I made two of them because the weather's getting cold here and this is one of my last chances to get out into my fair weather foundry. Well off comes the compound for a week because this will take me several days to do but now with the compound out of the way I will take the, the cross slide off next and take it over to the bench because I need some dimensions off of this for the dovetail but I took it off to show you how that's going to fit up of course we again have to have some removed here and that will be screwed right on to the uh, cross slide here a little bit of a, if I can find it here, some contouring is necessary. 
So that's the game plan. So this is how the cross slide comes off. I've already loosened up. There's the nut. I've loosened that up previously. And the screw. And then that'll slide right off. T-bolts can come off by dropping them through that hole. There's the gib. And I'll take all my measurements off of this piece. For the dovetail, that is. I'm ready to start cutting. As you know, a casting is not that accurate or true, and I have to get rid of the pattern draft. And I really slapped this thing together very quickly. So I laid out a center line. I don't know if it shows up or not, but it's in red. And using my height gauge, surface gauge I mean, I have checked the height of the center line on that side and then again on this side and it took a little adjusting so it's not really setting flat on the other side and now I will true up this side then flip it over and I won't have to monkey with the surface gauge on the second side because it will set on the trued side and I'm just going to take it down far enough to clean it up. No dimensions. Here we go. The dovetail will actually start right here and end about where that red line is. So I'm going to reduce the thickness of this up to that line right there and to this red line here and mill that off. I've been busy milling and much of it done off camera and I just had a horribly dull end mill. You probably could hear it so I had to change end mills and I finished this off to the thickness that I showed you previously and by the way it's the next day. Also I milled this just to clean it up and now I am approaching the point where I am ready to start the dovetail. But before I do that, and I've been doing some measurement here, and I'm going to talk a bit about that later on, but that'll be done, of course, with a, a dovetail cutter. But the dimensions are most uh, critical and kind of tricky, and I don't do this a whole lot, so I have to put a lot of thought into it and work slowly and methodically. But the first thing I'm going to do, even before I talk about this, I believe, is to go ahead and make myself a gib. Again, this is the gib. It's exactly eighth inch thick, so as uh, Providence would have it, I did do have a piece of eighth inch thick stock. However, it's hot rolled. I wish it was cold rolled, but uh, my wishes don't count. It's the right thickness anyway. So I'm going to put it in the mill, and it has to be milled to 30 degrees on each side to this final dimension, which is, uh, well, I'll measure it off camera. So that's my next uh, step before I get into this. And I think there's enough there to where it now it's not really worth sawing. I'll just mill it down to the uh, dimension. I'll saw this off first. I'm not sure what the total length of the gib will be, but well, I guess I'll cut it just a little bit longer than this, and then I can always trim it. I'd always rather have it a little bit longer. So let me uh, go ahead and cut this off and get it set up in the mill and you can see how I'm going to do this. Here's the milling machine set up for the gib. A wavy parallel. 
And I'm going to leave that bodacious cutter in there, even though it's really overkill. I'm not in the mood for another tool change. And then just lay the work on top of that wavy parallel. And the vise set at 30 degrees. Did I say that or not? And the vise, of course, is bolted down. You can't see the bolts. And I am ready to cut. And here I go. You know, I usually don't show any mistakes because, of course, I don't make any mistakes, but uh, I just did. And one end of the gib is about 50 thousandths greater than the other end. And I measured it several times as I was doing that, and I changed parallels, and I did just about everything I could to uh, except check the accuracy of the vise. Now, this is one from overseas, of course. So I finally had to scrap the work. And I have to start over on that, and I'll show you that from start then, and by another method. And I should throw this vice away. It is the first time I've ever used this vice, I believe, and you know where it came from. Anyway, I put the last word indicator on here, and I got it set there so it's on zero. Need to zoom in on that a little bit. And this is just a parallel. And when I come over to the other end and check it right on the corner of the parallel, it's 50 thousandths higher there than it is here. So there's that much inaccuracy in the vise. Now I do understand that this is just a drill press vise, not, probably not meant for milling, but I thought for a simple job on lightweight work like this, it would be just fine, but wrong. So now let me try to do it right. All right, here's the way I should have done it in the first place. And there's so many different ways of approaching this, but I do have the head tilted 30 degrees off to the left. And the reason I avoided this the first time is I'd rather take a good proper caning than have to deal with tramming the head in again, even though I have all of the proper equipment. So, I switched vices. That's a brown and sharp vise. Raise your hand if you think I can count on it for accuracy and superbness. And there's a wavy parallel in there, so I'm back to square one here, just milling off the one side. Also, the only scrap I could find around here, eighth inch thick, had paint on it, so I'll have to deal with that later on. And then here I am on the other side. And it'll take just a few passes to take it down to the layout line, which I have marked on there, so it's the same width as the original. What a pleasure it is to do with this operation over my previous setup. Get yourself a set of wavy parallels if you do not already have some. And this is a piece of hot roll steel as well. And way too big a cutter. All done with that. Now the original has a hole in here. And the hole lines up with a little pin. You can't see from there, but the pin keeps it from sliding out. So I probably will have to pin this, but that will be done later. And this will be cut to length later, but there it is. Very nice fit. Paint removed. Some gibs have 
little pockets for the set screws uh, to ride in, but I see this one does not, so I'm not going to bother either. And I'll probably use three set screws. This has one, two, three, four, plus the pin. Anyway, I needed this to be finished in order to take some of the other measurements as I uh, start to work on that. And, you know, really that's quite enough frustration for today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm quitting and uh, I'll get a fresh start when I'm in a better mood on the morrow. Okay, time for to go to bed.